The Mirror of the Sea by Joseph Conrad Emblems of Hope Before an anchor can ever be raised, it must be let go, and this perfectly obvious truism brings me at once to the subject of the degradation of the sea language in the daily press of this country. Your journalist, whether he takes charge of a ship or a fleet, almost invariably casts his anchor. Now an anchor is never cast, and to take a liberty with technical language is a crime against the clearness, precision, and beauty of perfected speech. An anchor is a forged piece of iron, admirably adapted to its end, and technical language is an instrument wrought into perfection by ages of experience, a flawless thing for its purpose. An anchor of yesterday because nowadays there are contrivances like mushrooms and things like claws of no particular expression or shape, just hooks. An anchor of yesterday is in its way a most efficient instrument. To its perfection its size bears witness, for there is no other appliance so small for the great work it has to do. Look at the anchors hanging from the cat heads of a big ship. How tiny they are in proportion to the great size of the hull. Were they made of gold, they would look like trinkets, like ornamental toys, no bigger in proportion than a jeweled drop in a woman's ear. And yet upon them will depend, more than once, the very life of the ship. An anchor is forged and fashioned for faithfulness. Give it ground that it can bite, and it will hold till the cable parts, and then whatever may afterwards befall its ship, that anchor is lost. The honest, rough piece of iron, so simple in appearance, has more parts than the human body has limbs. The ring, the stock, the crown, the flukes the palms, the shank. All these, according to the journalist, is cast when a ship arriving at an anchorage is brought up. This insistence in using the odious word arises from the fact that a particularly benighted landsman must imagine the act of anchoring as a process of throwing something overboard, whereas the anchor ready for the work is already overboard and is not thrown over, but simply allowed to fall. It hangs from the ship's side, at the end of a heavy projecting timber called the cathead, in the bight of a short, thick chain, whose end, link, is suddenly released by a blow from a top maul, or the pull of a lever, when the order is given, and the order is not heave over, as the paraphrasist seems to imagine, but let go. As a matter of fact, nothing is ever cast in that sense on board ship, but the lead, of which a cast is taken, to search the depth of water on which she floats, a lashed boat, a spare spar, a cask, or what not, secured about the decks, is cast adrift when it is untied. Also, the ship herself is cast to port or starboard when getting under way. She, however, never casts her anchor. To speak with severe technicality, a ship or a fleet is brought up, the complementary words, unpronounced and unwritten, being, of course, to an anchor. Less technically, but not less correctly, the word anchored with the characteristic appearance and resolute sound ought to be good enough for the newspapers of the greatest maritime country in the world. The fleet anchored at Spithead. Can anyone want a better sentence for brevity and seamanlike ring? But the cast anchor trick, with its affection of being a sea phrase, for why not write just as well through anchor, flung anchor, or shied anchor, is intolerably odious to a sailor's ear. I remember a coasting pilot of my early acquaintance, he used to read the newspapers assiduously, who, 
To define the utmost degree of lovelerniness in a landsman, used to say he is one of them poor miserable cast anchor devils. From first to last, the seaman's thoughts are very much concerned with his anchors. It is not so much that the anchor is a symbol of hope as that it is the heaviest object that he has to handle on board his ship at sea in the usual routine of his duties. The beginning and the end of every passage are marked distinctly by work about the ship's anchors. A vessel in the channel has her anchors always ready, her cable shackled on, and the land almost always in sight. The anchor and the land are indissolubly connected in a sailor's thoughts. But directly she is clear in the narrow seas, heading out into the world with nothing solid to speak of between her and the South Pole. The anchors are got in and the cables disappear from the deck, but the anchors do not disappear. Technically speaking, they are secured in board and on the forecastle head, lashed down to ring bolts with ropes and chains under the straining sheets of the head sails. They look very idle and as if asleep. Thus bound, but carefully looked after, inert and powerful, those emblems of hope make company for the lookout man and the night watches, and so the days glide by with the long rest of those characteristically shaped pieces of iron reposing forward, visible from almost every part of the ship's deck, waiting for their work on the other side of the world somewhere, while the ship carries them on with a great rush and splutter of foam underneath the sprays of the open sea rust their heavy limbs. The first approach to the land, as yet invisible to the crew's eyes, is announced by the brisk order of the chief mate to the boatswain. We will get the anchors over this afternoon, or first thing tomorrow morning, as the case may be. For the chief mate is the keeper of the ship's anchors and the guardian of her cable. There are good ships and bad ships, comfortable ships and ships where, from first day, to last of the voyage, there is no rest for a chief's mate's body and soul, and ships are what men make them. This is a pronouncement of sailor wisdom, and no doubt, in the main, it is true. However, there are ships where, as an old grizzled mate once told me, nothing ever seems to go right, and Looking from the poop where we both stand, I had paid him a neighborly call and deck, he added, she's one of them. He glanced up at my face, which expressed a proper professional sympathy, and set me right in my natural surmise. Oh no, the old man's right enough. He never interferes. Anything that's done in a seaman-like way is good enough for him, and yet somehow nothing ever seems to go right in this ship. I tell you what, she is naturally unhandy. The old man, of course, was his captain, who just then came on deck in a silk hat and brown overcoat, and, with a civil nod to us, went ashore. He was certainly not more than thirty, and the elderly mate, with a murmur to me of, That's my old man, proceeded to give the instances of the natural unhandiness of the ship, in a sort of deprecatory tone, as if to say, you mustn't think I bear a grudge against her for that. The instances do not matter. The point is that there are ships where things do go wrong, but whatever the ship, good or bad, lucky or unlucky, is in the forepart of her that her chief mate feels most at home. It is emphatically his end of the ship though, of course, he is the executive supervisor of the whole. There are his anchors, his headgear, his foremast, his station for maneuvering when the captain is in charge, and there, too, live the men, the ship's hands, whom it is the duty to keep employed, fair weather or foul, for the ship's welfare. It is the chief mate, 
the only figure of the ship's afterguard who comes bustling forward at the cry of all hands on deck. He is the satrap of that province in the autocratic realm of the ship, and more personally responsible for anything that may happen there. There, too, on the approach to the land, assisted by the boatswain and the carpenter, he gets the anchors over, with the men of his own watch, whom he knows better than the others. There he sees the cable ranged, the windlass disconnected, the compressors opened, and there, after giving his own last order, stand clear of the cable, he waits attentive, in a silent ship that forges slowly ahead towards her picked-out berth, for the sharp shout from aft, let go, instantly bending over, he sees the trusty iron fall with a heavy plunge under his eyes, which watch and note whether it has gone clear. For the anchor to go clear means to go clear of its own chain. Your anchor must drop from the bow of your ship with no turn of cable on any of its limbs, else you would be riding to a foul anchor. Unless the pull of the cable is fair on the ring, no anchor can be trusted even on the best of holding ground. In time of stress, it is bound to drag, for implements and men must be treated fairly to give you the virtue which is in them. The anchor is an emblem of hope, but a foul anchor is worse than the most fallacious of false hopes that ever lured men or nations into a sense of security, and the sense of security, even the most warranted, is a bad counselor. It is the sense which, like the exaggerated feeling of well-being, ominous of the coming on of madness, precedes the swift fall of disaster. A seaman laboring under an undue sense of security becomes at once worth hardly half his salt. Therefore, of all my chief officers, the one I trust most was a man I called B. He had a red mustache, a lean face, also red and an uneasy eye. He was worth all his salt. On examining now, after many years, the residue of the feeling which was the outcome of the contact of our personalities, I discover, without much surprise, a certain flavor of dislike. Upon the whole, I think he was one of the most uncomfortable shipmates possible for a young commander. If it is permissible to criticize the absent, I should say he had a little too much of the sense of insecurity which is so invaluable in a seaman. He had an extremely disturbing air of everlastingly ready, even when seated at a table at my right hand before a plate of salt beef, to grapple with some impending calamity. I must hasten to add that he had also the other qualification necessary to make a trustworthy seaman, that of an absolute confidence in himself. What was really wrong with him was that he had these qualities in an unrestful degree. His eternally watchful demeanor, his jerky, nervous talk, even his, as it were, determined silences, seemed to imply, and I believe they did imply, that to his mind the ship was never safe in my hands. Such was the man who looked after the anchors of a less than five hundred ton bark. My first command, now gone from the face of the earth, but sure of a tenderly remembered existence as long as I live. No anchor could ever have gone down foul under Mr. B's piercing eye. It was good for one to be sure of that when, in an open roadstead, one heard in the cabin the wind pipe up. But still, there were moments when I detested Mr. B exceedingly, from the way he used to glare sometimes, I fancy that more than once he paid me back with interest. It so happened that we both loved the little bark very much, and it was just the defect of Mr. B's inestimable qualities 
that he would never persuade himself to believe that the ship was safe in my hands. To begin with, he was more than five years older than myself at a time of life when five years really do count, I being twenty-nine and he being thirty-four. Then, on our first leaving port, I don't see why I should make a secret of the fact that it was Bangkok. A bit of maneuvering of mine amongst the islands of the Gulf of Siam had given him an unforgettable scare. Ever since then, he had nursed in secret a bitter idea of my utter recklessness. But upon the whole, and unless the grip of a man's hand at parting means nothing whatever, I conclude that we did like each other at the end of the two years and three months well enough. The bond between us was the ship, and therein a ship, though she has female attributes and is loved very unreasonably, is different from a woman. That I should have been tremendously smitten with my first command is nothing to wonder at, but I suppose I must admit that Mr. B's sentiment was of a higher order. Each of us, of course, was extremely anxious about the good appearance of the beloved object, and though I was the only one to glean compliments ashore, B had the more intimate pride of feeling, resembling that of a devoted handmaiden. And that sort of faithful and proud devotion went so far as to make him go about flicking the dust off the varnished teakwood rail of the little craft with a silk pocket handkerchief, a present from Mrs. B, I believe. That was the effect of his love for the bark, the effect of his admirable lack of the sense of security, once went so far as to make him remark to me, Well, sir, you are a lucky man. It was said in a tone full of significance, but not exactly offensive, and it was, I suppose, my innate tact that prevented my asking, What on earth do you mean by that? Later on, his meaning was illustrated more fully on a dark night in a tight corner during a dead-on shore gale. I had called him up on deck to help me consider our extremely unpleasant situation. There was not much time for deep thinking, and his summing up was, It looks pretty bad, whichever we try, but then, sir, you always get out of a mess somehow. It is difficult to disconnect the idea of ship's anchors from the idea of the ship's chief mate, the man who sees them go down clear and come up sometimes foul, because not even the most unremitting care can always prevent a ship, swinging to winds and tide, from taking an awkward turn of the cable round stock or fluke. Then the business of getting the anchor and securing it afterwards is unduly prolonged, and made a weariness to the chief mate. He is the man who watches the growth of the cable, a sailor's phrase which has all the force, precision, and imagery of technical language that, created by simple men with keen eyes for the real aspect of things they see in their trade, achieves the just expression seizing upon the essential, which is the ambition of the artist in words. Therefore the sailor will never say, cast anchor, and the shipmaster aft will hail his chief mate on the forecastle in impressionistic phrase, how does the cable grow, because grow is the right word for the long drift of a cable, emerging aslant under the strain taut as a bowstring above the water, and it is the voice of the keeper of the ship's anchors that will answer, Grows right ahead, sir, or broad on the bow, or whatever concise and deferential shout will fit the case. There is no order more noisily given or taken up with lustier shouts on board a homeward-bound merchant ship than the command, Man the windlass. The rush of expectant men out of the forecastle the snatching of hand spikes, the tramp of feet, the clink of the poles, make a stirring accompaniment to a plaintive up-anchor song with a roaring chorus, and this burst of noisy activity from a whole ship's crew seems like a voiceful awakening 
of the ship herself. Till then, in the picturesque phrase of Dutch seamen, lying asleep upon her iron. For a ship with her sails furled on her squared yards, and reflected from truck to water line in the smooth gleaming sheet of a landlocked harbor, seems, indeed, to a seaman's eye, the most perfect picture of slumbering repose. The getting of your anchor was a noisy operation on board a merchant ship of yesterday, an inspiring, joyous noise, as if with the emblem of hope the ship's company expected to drag up out of the depths each man all his personal hopes into the reach of a securing hand, the hope of home, the hope of rest, of liberty, of dissipation, of hard pleasure, following the hard endurance of many days between sky and water, and this noisiness, this exaltation, at the moment of the ship's departure, make a tremendous contrast to the silent moments of her arrival in a foreign roadstead, the silent moments when, stripped of her sails, she forges ahead to her chosen berth, the loose canvas fluttering softly in the gear above the heads of the men standing still upon her decks, the master gazing intently forward from the break of the poop. Gradually she loses her way, hardly moving, with the three figures on her forecastle, waiting attentively about the cathead for the last order of, perhaps, full ninety days at sea, let go. This is the final word of a ship's ended journey, the closing word of her toil and of her achievement, in a life whose worth is told out in passages from port to port, the splash of the anchor's fall and the thunderous rumbling of the chain are like the closing of a distant period of which she seems conscious with a slight deep shudder of all her frame by so much as she nearer to her appointed death for neither years nor voyages can go on forever it is to her like the striking of a clock and in the pause which follows she seems to take count of the passing of time. This is the last important order. The others are mere routine directions. Once more the master is heard, give her forty-five fathom to the water's edge, and then he too is done for a time. For days he leaves all the harbor work to his chief mate, the keeper of the ship's anchor and of the ship's routine. For days his voice will not be heard raised about the decks, with that curt, austere accent of the man in charge, till again, when the hatches are on, and in a silent and expectant ship, he shall speak up from aft in commanding tones, man the windlass.